Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Welcome to Fantasy Readers Advisory, Exploring New Worlds. I'm so thrilled to introduce you to our moderator, Christy Chadwick. Christy is a consultant with the Massachusetts Library System, where she provides training, continuing education, and advisory services across the state. She also serves as adjunct faculty of the School of Library and Information Science at Simmons University, a regular reviewer and writer for Library Journal. She has also served as our sci-fi fantasy columnist since 2016. Christy, thank you so much for being here. We're happy to have you. Thank you, Stephanie, and thanks everybody for coming in today live. I am so happy to be joining you to talk about all things fantasy. Um, it's always been a real big passion of mine. As Stephanie said, I work, you know, I've worked with Library Journal since 2016 as their columnist, but before that, for several years, just doing reviewing for them, mostly in science fiction and fantasy. So let me pop up my slides and we will get started. Here we are. We're going to talk fantasy, readers' advisory, and exploring new worlds. Um, I always like to start with just kind of telling everybody what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk a little bit about if oh, my computer is going to go slow and decide to pop things. All right. I give everybody an agenda. I teach, so I always need to have an agenda when I do things. So we're going to start by talking about what exactly is fantasy. Um, a little bit of history, kind of where it came from. And I always like to talk about media trends. Whole um, collection and whole reader's advisory is really important in libraries because obviously, we all like to say we are not just books. So kind of get an idea of where people may be coming in from and where they have experienced fantasy, um, even if not in your library before. The big section is going to be all of our popular subgenres because fantasy is really one of those ones that has gone a bit granular. And I'm not even going to be covering every single subgenre, but I'm going to cover a lot of the major ones and also talk about um, a couple of the newest trends that I have been seeing. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about appeal factors and kind of how they can work in with um, Reader's Advisory. And I will show you some resources that you can also look into. And then we'll just conclude. And definitely feel free to put questions in the chat. And um, I may grab them from there while we're talking, or I may save some stuff until the end. So. All right. So what is fantasy? Fantasy really, if you boil down its definition, is part of a group that's called speculative fiction. Mystery falls under some type of speculative fiction at times. Horror is speculative fiction. Science fiction is speculative fiction. It really kind of asks questions and gives a sense of wonder. But what sets fantasy apart is that it includes magic or magical elements. And that can kind of be a little squishy at times, depending on what you're looking at as where the power comes from. Part of this is kind of the discussion, are superheroes fantasy? Well, I think it depends on who you talk to, because in most cases, they'll say yes, you know, their powers don't really come from any place. You look at Dr. Strange, you look at others, and you're like, okay, that's magic. That's definitely fantasy. But then if you look at X-Men and you look at mutants and you're looking at DNA and you're looking at the Fantastic Four who were exposed to radiation, that's really kind of science fiction. So it kind of slides both directions. So with superheroes, you're going to find people in both camps. But I have seen a lot of people try to kind of stick it more into fantasy because it just is kind of those unique elements that you're just not going to see in the world and don't really quite think they can exist either. Um, myth and folklore is obviously one of the big foundational um, pieces of fantasy. You are going to see a lot of actual 
trends that are happening right now that are um, based in myth and folklore. We'll be talking about some of those. And then the other key part is that it's usually set in a secondary world, um, which means it's not set on Earth. Um, and there's definitely a lot of classic fantasy that you can tell is just not really Earthbound. But that has changed a lot, especially over the last couple of decades, where you've seen a bigger expansion into contemporary fantasy and romantic fantasy, where you are actually seeing them set on earth doing things in basically a regular world there just happens to be magic with it too and while we're not talking about science fiction today i always like to kind of give the definition of how you divide those two out because in library journal we review them together and a lot of times they are talked about together almost kind of interchangeably but they're definitely different um, the border is really kind of between what can and cannot exist in the world um, mutants possibly could exist in the world if they have been exposed to radiation or 100 million years down the road and things have changed and maybe climate change is going to sprout people that all of a sudden can talk to animals and plants. We don't know. It could happen. And that is just kind of one of those things that does that make it science fiction? Science fiction usually is stuff that could actually occur from a scientific point of view in the future, or is there just no way that that's actually going to happen? But again, it's squishy. You're going to hear squishy a lot because when there is a lot of genre blending, when there's a lot of boundary kind of meshing between different genres, I like to say it gets squishy. And science fantasy is actually one of those things that has gotten really squishy where you obviously find fantasy elements and you find science fiction elements. And one that I like to talk about with this is Gideon the Ninth. Um, Tamsin Muir's um, series, The Gideon of the Ninth, was the first of that series. We we're all anxiously waiting for book four of that surprise quartet that she's giving us. And it's necromancers, which is raising the dead, dealing with bones, dealing with dead people, but they're on other planets and they are flying spaceships. So you've got the science element in there. So those are really where you kind of see those come together. And with fantasy, you see it come together in a, definitely a lot of places. So let's talk about kind of where the roots of fantasy came from. Um, as you see on my highly decorative timeline, um, really the core base and foundation is back in mythology. Um, mythology, the pantheons are really the base of what are considered a lot of fantasy stories. And even those pantheons that kind of have a religious aspect, some people will take those upon, take those stories and retell them in ways that they can make them into this fan even more fantastical than what has actually happened with them. So that's really kind of your foundational piece of it. Then we jump way ahead. There are definitely stories that have happened, but really where we start talking about modern fantasy is mid late 19th century, which really is not modern anymore, but it is really kind of what we understand as fantasy. This is when books such as Dracula came out. Um, we saw a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court. Arthurian legend is a, another big piece of what we consider kind of a little bit more modern fantasy, but obviously not something that has been, you know, really constrained to that time. Um, H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, Journey to the Center of the Earth, where we find dinosaurs and new lands at the core of our planet. Those would actually, some of those would be considered fantasy too. 
Then as we kind of move into the very early 20th century, this is where you start talking a little bit more about kind of some of the lost world fantasies. And a lot more children's stories actually come out at this time. Um, this is when we saw Peter and Wendy, which um, was ba the basis of Peter Pan. Wind in the Willows came out at this time because we have talking animals, which is definitely not something that we see right now. Um, the Lost World, The Land That Time Forgot, there was a lot of focus on kind of what what if we could this is like Jurassic Park before Jurassic Park actually came up it was considered fantasy where could we find these animals or these things that supposedly existed a long time ago but they're actually connected to our world right now in the 1920s, we have pulp magazines. Um, pulp magazines were called that because that's kind of what you could do with a particular paper. They would be printed and then they would be tossed and thrown away and kind of shredded into other things, almost kind of a recycling. But um, pulp magazines is really when fantasy started to become more popular in a short story or a serialized format. Um, magazine publications really took off then. We had such uh, titles as The Unknown or Weird Tales for Fantasy, and those continued to be published through then. And into the 1950s, um, this is where the pulp mag magazines really kind of started moving out a little bit out of monsters and kind of maybe some god stories into seeing more magic seeing more swords that sword and sorcery term that maybe some of you are familiar with it's not quite as um prevalent as it was kind of back I heard it a lot in the 80s and 90s is when we talked about sword and sorcery um so like the magazines like Weird Tales, um, Fellowship of the Ring came out in the 50s. Um, Poole Anderson came out with The Broken Sword. And the Narnia series is not entirely just um, sword and sorcery, but there is definitely aspects of that. And those all came out in the 50s too. So you're kind of seeing that whole audience kind of blend and open up because you're seeing ages you're seeing titles for children you're seeing titles for adults and they are starting to take on that definitely the more magical element and getting out of monsters and we're starting to see some of that serial um, swords and wars and fighting and then um in the 60s is when high fantasy, which is definitely still one of our subgenres today, this is when we started to see these really take off and kind of go into our really modern tales. Um, examples of some of those high fantasies is Witch World by Andre Norton. The Last Unicorn came out in the 60s. Um, Ursula Le Guin, A Wizard of Earthsea, and The Black Cauldron. So this is kind of how fantasy has evolved through the last couple of centuries and backwards and all of it has kind of a mythical a magical tone to it although you did see a lot more of that kind of Arthurian influence come in especially as sword and sorcery came out in the 60s and even though it looks like a lot of this is very male dominated. And if we start having conversations about that, we're going to go in a totally different direction than I want to go for this. But in the 60s is actually when we started seeing a lot more um, female identified authors coming out. Um, you know, Wizard of Earth, Sea, Witch World, those are all, you know, women started actually publishing novels they and they started coming out then and even now it's not as marginalized as you may see it um, with other authors but there's still some kind of discussion with it because one of the things that's happening now is that female identified authors a lot of times if they are writing a fantasy book they they're automatically labeled as young adult. So that's one of the things that's happening with kind of identifying the audiences and making sure that you know where 
what type of audience your fantasy books are for as you go through because it's easy to identify the children's books. It's usually easy to identify the adult books too. And YA is one of those kind of slippery slopes where we do see a lot of fantasy. And I'm not going to touch too much on YA fantasy, but just to say that it's easy to understand why unfortunately female identified authors have been kind of placed in the role of writing YA but they're definitely not writing that way so it's just one of the things you want to consider when we start talking about readers advisory of what people are looking for and kind of how to put them in an audience because there's a lot of crossover for reading um in through all of the audiences, especially for adults, you know, they can read children's books, they can read young adult books, and young adults many times can go in either direction too. So you kind of want to make sure to know what your patron is looking for in that case when you're starting to identify what they want. Okay, so we're going to go into some trends right now. And in these particular trends, we're actually talking kind of about the media. And um, I always like to start there, as I said, because usually when we have a patron come in who has it, says they haven't really experienced fantasy, they don't read it, they don't like it. If you start to have a conversation with them, you'll find out that they've actually have taken in a lot of fantasy stories. They've just taken them in in different in different formats. First place to go to is games. Um, I think gaming is really, really growing in popularity in libraries. And it's a really good way to kind of suss out how your patrons are looking to experience their type of fantasy. Um, here you can see we've got some examples, um, Dungeons and Dragons. This was the first tabletop game that really kind of existed in the fantasy genre. I remember playing Dungeons and Dragons when I was a sixth grader, and that's really kind of when it was new. That was a few decades ago, um, <laughs> but... Now there are libraries that are holding a lot of different sessions. There are gaming sites that are doing sessions. You can experience it virtually or you can experience it in person playing tabletop. And it is something that is a draw for many different ages. Um, it's not only the kids or the tweens and teens that are playing this. There are a lot of adults that are coming back to this too because like me, they did play it at those younger ages. And so finding this resurgence back into this type of gaming has really found it to be a connection point and has worked for libraries a lot. Magic the Gathering is a card game. Some people are not interested in um, tabletop games, but they like to collect things. And Magic the Gathering not only is a playing game, but it's a collecting game. So that is something that I have seen. I have a 10-year-old who likes to tell me the inordinate list of his Magic the Gathering cards and how they are done and how they work through it. I don't understand any of it, but I am glad that he is loving it. And I have seen different age levels who have enjoyed it too. And I've seen some libraries that are doing Magic the Gathering. And it kind of goes along the lines of like, you know, it's Magic the Gathering, it's Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh. All three of those actually kind of really started to come up about 10 to 15 years ago, and now they're coming back again. And I think that that's what we're seeing a lot, maybe in all genres, but in fantasy for sure, when we're talking about media trends, things that have existed are coming back. And you're going to see those themes as we go further into not only the media, but the subgenres and kind of see how, you know, there's only so far that you can explore. So things definitely tend to repeat themselves. 
The other thing in here, obviously, is video games. And video games are definitely a big draw, especially for teens. You may have some type of video game service, whether you are lending or you're having them be able to explore different games and formats um, by having programming in your library. Final Fantasy has been one of those role-playing games that has been around for a very long time and has gone through many numerations of how it has changed and really has emphasized how the fantasy genre has been a big draw in this. And, you know, this is not a particular game that you can give to all ages, but there are definitely ones that kind of imitate it in different ways that you can find for different age levels. So you're not going to hand Final Fantasy to a seven-year-old who likes to game, but you may be able to hand them. They're almost ready for Zelda sometimes, or if you find Link, uh, those type of games, sometimes they are simple enough that it is something that they can do. Um, as I said, my 10-year-old just loves these things, so I'm kind of like experiencing it through him. But um, all of these are things that if your patron hasn't experienced them directly, they may be related to or living with someone who does. And it can become its own reader's advisory moment for them if they're familiar with it. Another thing that comes in, obviously, is the movies. And, you know... Whatever we think of the author, the Harry Potter movie series has been something that has like exploded um, this type of movie genre at its time. And it is still enjoyed by many people. So obviously it is one of those ones that exists kind of in real life, but has that alternate secondary world that they exist in. But we can go back in time and we can look at things such as Pan's Labyrinth. This is definitely what they would consider dark fantasy. This is one of those stories where everything feels a little creepy, not quite horror, but kind of getting into it. And that may be something that a patron likes to see. They like to kind of feel a little, you know, they like to wiggle in their seat a little bit. They're not sure if they should hide their eyes or something about something that's going to happen. And fantasy has definitely delved into that a lot, too. Um, Lord of the Rings, obviously, another big one. When you start looking at books that have been changed, that have been turned into movies, um, these are all things that have really kind of exploded inside of these particular formats. And then um, Studio Ghibli, obviously, you know, that started in 1986. That is, you know, whether you consider it anime or not anime, or depending on who you talk to and how specialized you are, you may be able to describe it differently. But Miyazaki um, has produced all of these movies. And these movies are considered classics in a lot of um, ways. I know that, like, every summer, my local theater does a Miyazaki series and they show the movies like once every two weeks and they do this every summer because they know they have the people who want to come see them over and over again and even though you know he supposedly retired he had to come back and give us one more last year with the boy and the heron which just kind of shows how it can be live action as we see from a lot of these things, or, you know, partially live action, like in Pan's Labyrinth, or possibly, you know, The Dark Cauldron, um, or anime, when we are dealing with Studio Ghibli and others. And then for those of us who can't go to the movies all the time, well, hopefully we have TV. And television has been a long time place for fantasy stories. And some of these, like when I was doing research, I'm like, oh yeah, I used to watch that. Oh yeah, I used to watch that too. And really there was a big research of this um, in the late 80s through the early 2000s. And I think it's changed obviously from primetime TV. I mean, 
How many of you saw the original Beauty and the Beast? I forgot that there was a reboot of it, like in the early 2000s, or it was like around 2010, and they did a reboot of it. And this is one of those things that you see in fantasy all the time is the reboot or the retelling. And you're going to see a lot of that as a theme going through. Um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you know, obviously, I'm not even talking about comics or graphic novels. And that is another format in a way to be able to talk about how fantasy has kind of expanded and exploded through the different formats that a library can work with. But you get to move on from like, you know, for those who don't have primetime television, but they have streaming services, obviously the Game of Thrones really kind of took the world by storm at its time and for that particular series, even though we don't really know how it ends at this point, even though the show has ended, the books have not, or maybe they have, depends on who you talk to, but, um, you know, just now with Percy Jackson and the Olympians being um, redone, and this is something, this is another topic that has been redone. There's been already like three different movies that have been done, and now this new t television series, which we are loving in my house, I have to say, um, is another way for people to get introduced to kind of some of the themes and entertainment of fantasy. So you may have parents who are watching this with their kids and realizing how entertaining it is and focus, even though it focuses on the characters, you are going to see, you know, all of this, how, um, you know, these people are working in real life too. And obviously, you know, there's others, um, whether it's been books, most of them have been books or other things that have been rebooted or are going to be rebooted like this year. Um, you know, Good Omens, everyone's looking forward to the next season of that. We've got Wheel of Time that is on right now, Percy Jackson. Um, another Avatar, The Last Airbender is coming this year, coming next month. And Anansi Boys um, by Neil Gaiman is also going to be coming later this year. So all of these things that people know have been popular are just being transferred into a different format. And people may discuss this as an entry point because well I'm not a reader but I love to watch shows it's that's where you catch them is you say well did you see this show well then maybe you like to actually read the book or check out the graphic novel or explore how else you can actually experience this story that you loved Another thing I'd like to talk about, too, is kind of who is giving us these fantasy books in, you know, in our world here. So publishers and imprints. I did not, if, if I had to tie the publishers to their imprints, it would be kind of like that meme of the guy with all of the strings and stuff, because I can't keep track of them anymore. Um, and it's, and it's strange because it used to be that publishers would have an imprint to go to a different genre. Well, that's been creeping up. Um, Macmillan is one of those. I like to talk about them because um, Tor.com is one of their imprints and they became really, really well known when they started out um, as a publishing branch because they started publishing novellas and novellas are shorter works. They are um, basically 17 and a half to 40,000 words, which means it's anywhere from 70 to 160 pages. For some people who don't want to tackle, you know, a Harry Potter size book, they don't mind 160 pages. You know, it's like reading some of these shorter books um, in, the juvenile collection. So you may have adults who are interested in it, but they feel that sometimes the books are too long. This is one way that you can actually give them the experience of reading these. Um, so tour.com, as I said, you know, was kind of an arm. And then we have tour books, 
to be different from Tor. They have Tor books and they publish science fiction fantasy. Well, now Macmillan, as it of the publishing house also publishes science fiction and fantasy under just Macmillan. So, you know, we don't know where all this stuff is coming from anymore, but there's a lot of great publishers and also knowing it is that smaller presses, we don't see the smaller presses as much, especially if we are looking to reviews. Um, We do have forward, which is a free, review magazine that does deal with more small and sometimes independent publishers but some of the smaller publishers that we have in here like uproar books blind eye books small beer press which actually is a publishing house not too far from me in the next town over i'm in western massachusetts they all have actually published books that have won awards and but they're not the ones that you're necessarily going to see all the time in um, novelist or in a library journal although sometimes you will they're get they're able to spread out kind of some of that a little bit more but it depends on kind of how much they're being promoted and what's happening with them you can definitely find quality fantasy titles from those smaller presses too and they are easier to get also with the advent of nat galley and edelweiss because those are places that booksellers and librarians can find upcoming titles um, and sometimes get digital advances too if you're not necessarily seeing as many of those print arcs that maybe your library used to get and you do have people who read digital you can find some of them on there too Okay. Last trend I want to talk about is magazines. Um, One thing that we've seen happen, you know, it started happening kind of in the early 2000s, but is definitely we're seeing more of now is that a lot of these print magazines that have kind of developed from the pulp magazine line, they've gone online now. So a lot of these are only digital, but you are going to find that there's a lot of very classic There's classic fantasy in there, science fiction, but there's also a lot of new formats. They're dealing with poetry. They're dealing with um, exponent, you know, they're dealing with stories that kind of break the barrier. And a lot of them are shorter works, which sometimes is a draw for people. Um, Fantasy magazine that we have on here did start in print in 2005, but they went online in 2007, and so they still publish stuff now, and you'll see very new authors. Some authors that I've seen win awards over the last couple of years started in these magazines, and they've developed their works from there. Um, Clark's World is an online only magazine that publishes a lot of fantasy. Uncanny Magazine started in um, 2009 and it's a husband and wife co-publisher. The wife Lynn Thomas, she works at the Champaign-Urbana Archives, so she's a librarian, go her. Um, But they actually were able to publish a print 10-year anthology book that came out in 2019, which was a big hit with a very big collection of stories from some new authors, but then also some very popular authors like Sarah Pinsker and Fran Wild. And so kind of being able to put new names with older names like this um, is really a good way to kind of introduce some of your patrons to them too. Um, I had mentioned Small Beer Press before. Well, this is their online and print zine, Lady Churchill's Rosebud Wristlet. So they do a lot of short works, um, poetry, and different ways to express fantasy stories. And then in 2017, um, Faya came out, and it this is actually um, really focusing on Black authors who are writing speculative fiction, and they what we've seen a lot of times is that sometimes the black, our black authors have been marginalized out of mainstream publishing markets. So this is a magazine devoted strictly to 
both African and diaspora Black authors who can write their experiences within speculative fiction and focus directly on them. In fact, this magazine has already spurred their own awards ceremony, so they have yearly awards that come out for different um, stories and also for some of their writers, too. Um, I don't know if they offer library subscriptions. I can check into some of these. A lot of them you can actually go on their website and get um, some of some of the stories. It'll probably be a curated collection of them. Um, and then otherwise, it may be something that you may not necessarily can subscribe to where you can get it like a database, but you may be able to, if you circulate any type of your own devices or e-readers, you'd be able to put them on there like that and um, offer some of them on there too. But I say, you know, it's always something that you can talk to. Um, one of the publishers or their publicists there, they're always really great to talk to and very easy. And maybe they can figure out some of them may be in libraries already and have already really taken off on this. And some of them just may love to have the chance to be able to showcase their stuff in libraries too. That's a great question, Aubrey, thanks. All right, let's get into some of these fantasy subgenres because they are, as I said, they are numerous. We're not going to be covering all of them here today, but we're going to cover a lot of the ones that we do see prominently now. And a couple that I see are kind of like really still very, very popular today. So high fantasy, epic fantasy, they're used interchangeably. There are some slight nuanced differences, but most of the time if someone asks for high fantasy, they're looking for epic fantasy. And it's really defined by, you know, the sweeping nature of setting or they're going on, you know, they're going on a huge quest that usually is a signifier that this is epic. Um, but high fantasy really means that they are set in a secondary world. They are not set on earth. And conversely, low fantasy is something that is magical that intrudes on an otherwise regular world. And so most of the time that's earth, or it may just be the existence of a different planet, but it is just seems very normalized as one has to say. Um, a couple of ones I wanted to point out from here, Rhythm of War. Brandon Sanderson writes for many different audiences. He's got children's books. He's got young adult books, and he's got adult books. Um, this is part of his series where book four of this, where this um, sweeping desert world uh, with storms of um, that have really kind of changed the ecological power and these nights that used to exist are all of a sudden coming back into the world and the wars that they are going to cause. The fifth book of this series is coming out in December. It doesn't have a title yet, as far as I know. Um, and otherwise, it is something that a lot of the adult readers are looking forward to, especially since last year he kind of did that Kickstarter series of books that he kind of self-funded for himself. So people are excited to have him come back to something that has already existed. Um, Bonechar Daughter was the first of a trilogy where the power uh, to create magical constructs from bones, and these were actual bone shards that were removed from different people in this land. And the emperor is the one who had the power to do it. But the people are beginning to revolt against this and hide their children, and it is causing um, civil war between all of these water islands that exist under this empire. Um, all three books of this trilogy are out now, so it is something that you would be able to look for right now. Um, Legends and Lattes, Travis Baldry, he 
this book was a TikTok sensation. Um, so that's how we've seen a lot of some over the last couple of years, fantasy books and different genres also. But you'll hear about the last book talk sensation. And a lot of times they are independently published books that all of a sudden explode on TikTok and publishers come and scoop them up. So Legends and Lattes um, is the first book of this where a mercenary who is an an orc who is a mercenary, I should say, identify him, her that way, retires, doesn't want to fight anymore, and instead wants to open a coffee shop. The problem is, is that nobody in her land actually knows what coffee is. And sometimes it's really, really hard to get out of your former job, especially if you used to wield a sword. So that is her story. And then the sequel, Bookshops and Bone Dust, just came out also. These are what they're calling cozy fantasy also, where it's really kind of low stakes. It is epic. It's epic fantasy, but it's not a high stakes thing. It is something that you actually see the characters really develop and be cozy in this. And you wouldn't think that that sort of thing could be cozy, but cozy has left the mysteries now and has come into science fiction and fantasy. So the, this is something that has kind of expanded that way. And that's another way that you can kind of people bring, start bringing people out of whatever genre they're in, especially if they like, they like the cozy, they like the comforting reads. There's definitely a big uptake in that kind of consideration coming into fantasy too. So dystopian is you know, relating to or denoting an imagined state of society where there's suffering. The land, you know, can be post-apocalyptic or dystopian. And most people kind of consider this, this goes between both fantasy and science fiction. It just kind of really depends on the story itself and the setting of where it actually ends up in that subgenre. Um, but all of these are considered dystopian fantasy. So obviously Sarah J. Moss, We've heard a lot of her stories, um, you know, The Court of Thorn and, Thorn and Roses, that series is really focused on the Fae, the Fae lands, um, treacherous lands and treacherous people. And that entire series, you know, we've heard from a lot, unfortunately, of um, some of the censorship is happening with this particular author too but she keeps writing her books and publishing. So um, it's becoming as much of a draw as it is um, something that people are kind of looking to get rid of too. Rebecca Yaros with The Fourth Wing. Um, this is a really harsh but elite college setting for dragon riders. And um, just to give you a little preview, this is something that you're going to see coming up in our hot topics also. And then When Women Were Dragons, this came out um, from Kelly Barnhill, who's well known in um, juvenile writing, but this was her first adult novel and it was spectacular. And it is would be considered low fantasy because it's basically set on Earth and starts, I believe, in the 1940s or 50s, where all of a sudden, like, in this one instance, over 100,000 women across the world turned into dragons and all flew away. And the world has no idea how to deal with that. And there, it's focused on this one girl whose mother was one of those people and kind of how she had to navigate her life growing up with this and how the world really tried to kind of hide it. And something like that you can't really hide but the rest of humanity has to find ways to deal with it and some of them were really interesting ways
So grimdark and dark fantasy is kind of what you hear a little bit more than dystopian at this point. Um, this really has to deal with your tone, the setting, or the style of writing where just everything seems dark. Everything seems really gritty. Everything is hard. You know, the landscapes are barren. The people seem to be, you know, amoral or they're cynical or they're flawed. Um, dystopian is kind of like brushes against grimdark, but there's, you know, there's limits to how those go. Um, George R.R. R. Martin obviously was kind of where grimdark really, really grew as a particular subgenre. Um, you know, it's kind of considered the flip side of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings as that epic side where you really kind of see the dark path that people will take. Um, and it can slip into horror a little bit, um, so it can be a little disturbing or frightening, um, but those are ways that people, you know, kind of like to experience that. Sometimes you want to see something that's a little bit harsher than your own world to kind of immerse yourself in, so besides um, Martin's Game of Thrones, there usually any, almost any fantasy that you can see that is kind of epic, but talks about, you know, challenges and all of that will kind of skirt along the same sort of grim dark. Um, the Poppy War, which was R.F. Quang's um, series, was kind of one of those Mulan retellings, which there's been a lot of over the past few years, but um, really focuses on magic and the kind of just trying to survive and the decisions that this character had to make. And then T. Kim Fisher's Nettle and Bone is almost kind of a fairy tale, but it's really not a happy one. Not that fairy tales were really happy if you kind of, you know, if you get outside of Disney and actually start digging into them. But this one kind of really takes it in a way of a young woman who kind of wants to try to save her family from um the royal prince who exists and what she'll go through and what magic she'll go through to be able to do that. So urban fantasy basically means that the narrative is set in a city. Technically, it's a subgenre of contemporary fantasy, but sometimes that can you know, that can slide a little bit into historical also, but usually it is more modern than not. Um, you know, but there are precursors of urban fantasy were popular in the 19th century, but this term really kind of dates back to the 70s. Um, so there was kind of, you know, light supernatural fare in the movies. You see a little bit of there. You see a little bit of it on TV. And then the term really grew in the 80s, especially here in North America. And there was a boon of books that were urban fantasy. It really was the subgenre that people loved. But then it disappeared. Um, you know, not all of it, as we can see by some of these examples. But where you actually find it now, um, there has been a resurgence of urban fantasy, but it's more in um, small press and self-publishing. Um, even though we don't like to talk about the big A, um, if you use Amazon services and if you look at Kindle publishing, there is a lot of urban fantasy on there. That is where that market is. Some of those books you can find in Overdrive or other digital collections. Um, but, you know, most of them are kind of stuck within that particular bubble that Amazon has created. But here we do have some of the big names of what of who is known for urban fantasy. So Shauna McGuire, um, her Toby Day series has been around for quite a while. The latest is Be the Serpent. You have um, Faye the fey world and where it intersects with um, and lays over kind of North America and the rest of the series. And she is kind of an investigator, but also kind of a knight and depends on what she's working on. But you see a lot of um, fantasy intersections between supernatural creatures and gods and goddesses in here. 
Um, Jim Butcher's Dresden series obviously is continuing. Battleground has been the most recent and he is a wizard who lives in Chicago who does um, investigations and how they have intersected with the police and other supernatural creatures there too. Kim Harrison, um, her Hollow series was a magical series that was set, um, I want to say Cincinnati, but I'm not sure if that's quite correct. It's a C word. It's a C town. I know that for sure. But she actually um, has her new book, Three Kinds of Lucky, which is taking magic kind of almost in a scientific route and where magic leaves kind of you know, dirt. And um, this focuses on one of those people who is really great at collecting that dirt and kind of how she's subjugated by people who actually can cast spells and use this magic and how something goes awry and she ends up being the one who has to clean it up figuratively and literally. Um, but I've always enjoyed Kim Harrison's work. So if you kind of want, you know, especially you want those strong characters, even though Dresden is male, a lot of these urban fantasies, you do see females as the primary protagonist. And Dresden does have a lot of secondary protagonists um, that he works with that are female that have that same strong essence that you kind of like to see so if you have people who like to have those strong female characters really any of these authors and several more would be great to suggest to them okay gas lamp fantasy um steampunk is more considered science fiction it can blur into fantasy, but Gaslamp has actually evolved into a more specific subgenre. So you have the Regency period, Victorian, Edwardian era influences, and sometimes it draws on some of the Gothic horror. So you kind of have all of that mixed in. Um, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell was kind of considered where Gaslamp fantasy started. And it's been one that is still constantly on best fantasy lists. Soulless, for anybody who read Gail Carringer's books when those came out, you know, definitely has its steampunk leanings, but there are a lot of paranormal characters. So it's always a good series and it's a lighter it's bantery if you have someone who likes to read romance and but because the characters are fun and they interact in a good way soulless um and gail carringer would be a good one to kind of look at and then a marvelous light was the start of this series by freya marsk who came out last year or ended last year it's a trilogy and it's a world where magic is really desired but only the powerful can claim it and um kind of you have these inter you have different pairs of characters in each book, but, they, but they're but they all interconnected and they do all come together in the last one. And that's really something great about fantasy is that you may see a wide range of characters, but you always find out where they connect to each other. Wuxia or Zanjia is Chinese fantasy, and don't ask me to pronounce those again, but it's a historical fantasy. Um, Wuxia, the word means martial heroes itself, and they're heavily inspired by Chinese mythology, some religious philosophies, and you really are looking at heroes, sometimes gods. Um, between the two and so some of the popular titles that you may be familiar with or you may find people who would be interested in are Fonda Lee's Jade City that series for her is a reimagined world it's not quite contemporary it kind of seems like 70s 80s but it is its own island um, where the Many people have powers from Magical Jade and this is a family series. Um, it's been described as, you know, fantasy meets the godfather because it is really about these powerful clans trying to keep power on their, you know, in their home while these outside forces all of a sudden start coming in. Um, 
daughter of the moon goddess is part of a duology that is the story of the daughter of Chang, who was the moon goddess in China. And this is um, not only the Chinese mythology, but also the concept of a duology, especially in fantasy, I've seen actually increasing a lot. Trilogies have been really a big pull a lot of times and really the go-to with what you see with serial fantasy. But now we're starting to see a lot more duologies, some standalones, but you usually are seeing these um, two book um, series that are kind of tied together, which really helps because sometimes, you know, people will find that the first book is great. The second book's kind of saggy and it seems to go on forever, but you still have more stuff to do. And then book three tightens it up. And sometimes it's a great finish and sometimes it's okay. But if you tighten it to just two books, um, some people will find the appeal for that too. So knowing what your duologies are available in fantasy may be another way to draw people into reading it. He Who Drowned the World is the second of another of those duologies. This is an alternate China. It's another of those loose um, Mulan retellings. This one's about a girl who takes her brother's identity and his um, childhood fate for greatness and actually how she achieves it by becoming a man uh, and becoming um, emperor eventually of China and the way it is right then. So these are some of the big ones that I've seen recently that seem to be um, the subgenres and kind of the trends for where books are coming from um, last year and kind of into this year too. So fairy and folk tales and legends and gods, let's put that all together. So these are the retellings. These are the stories that a lot of us know, but they have been taken, they've been twisted, they've been fractured, however you like to do it, or they're told from a different perspective. And it's just given new life and a new way to go into some of these stories that we already know. Um, the Witch's Heart was a story about a witch who falls in love with the god Loki. And this really took off um, at this time. And also because of its Norse mythology, which is not something I'm highlighting, but is something that I have been seeing more of um, since last year, is that there's a lot of Nordic and Slavic folk tales and mythology that is are coming up as fantasy novels. So you may see a lot more of that. We used to see that in the mystery, you know, all the Nordic mysteries. Well, now it's coming into fantasy too. Um, Stone Blind by Natalie Hayes was, Haynes was um, the story of Medusa told from her perspective and kind of instead, while she is a monster, she's also the only mortal child of this family of immortals and kind of how that put her on the outside from the beginning, even from her family and everybody, and just kind of how that whole um, prophecy grew with her and Achilles. And then something a little different, we have Erica Johansson, and she's coming out with well, she just came out with this book, Kingdom of Sweets, and this one is kind of a retelling of the Nutcracker, where there are two sisters. You have Clara, and then you have her sister, and just kind of the trouble that they have in between themselves and um, when their sorcerer grandfather comes to show them this magical Nutcracker and what happens after that. So influences from stories, influences from mythology, these are all kind of showing up um, now. And I've seen even in 2024, we definitely have more of those coming. 
So there's lots of stuff about genre blends. We've got, you know, supernatural romance. We've got supernatural horror. We've got all these different things. And romantic fantasy has been around for quite a while, but there's definitely been a surge, especially when you give it a new name. So you may have heard the term romance to see. Um, it's strange. I don't know why we're using it, but that makes it new. It makes it popular. Then we're going to use it. But what we're seeing now is that there is really an intersection. And it used to be more, it was strictly fantasy, but had a little romance in it so that it could kind of, you know, draw, you know, a wider readership. Well, now what we're seeing is that it's actually the romance genre that is pulling in a lot more fantasy components and especially contemporary. Um, so the fake mate, which has just come out, um, this is a this is the romantic trope of the fake boyfriend. Um, but this one is about werewolves instead of just regular people. So you know they are being able to take these tropes um, from the romance genre and really pull in these other elements. Um, so you know you can kind of do it either way. And as you can tell, it's got one of those contemporary covers that we've been seeing a lot. So you know that this is new, this is fresh. And yeah, I don't know about the term either, Stephanie, but it's what some people are using. You've seen the publishers use it. You've seen other people use it. So we can still call it, you know, fantasy romance, romantic fantasy, whatever you want to call it. So <laughs> We, we can come up with our own new world, word today. Let's do that. <laughs> um, to Cage a God actually came out today. Um, this is a book by Elizabeth May. She has written both young adult and adult novels, um, both by herself and um, with Laura Lamb. And this one is about two sisters who have powers that were um, that basically you only see in the elite, um, those who are born to it, but their mother actually kind of did some bad things to them, like engraved it on their bones, because that's where the power is. So um, it's really kind of um, how their powers put them at odds with their vision for freedom from this elite group and kind of how it puts them at odds with each other. This is also going to be a duology, and I believe that the second book is coming out either late this year or early 2025. My new favorite book is someone you can build a nest in. This is coming out in April. It is not out yet, but John Wiswell has written us a wonderful, delightful romantic fantasy from the monster's point of view. This monster has fallen in love um, with, unfortunately, a monster hunter who turns out to be one of the people who is trying to kill her in this land. So she is trying to figure out when is the best time to tell her love that she's actually the monster she's looking for. So there's a there's some tongue in cheek and very dry humor, but um Shishi Shen is the monster and trying to say that name five times fast will drive you crazy, but it's it's sweet and it's not quite cozy because there is a little bit of like kind of graphic violence and stuff. And there's a little blood and all of that. So I wouldn't call it necessarily cozy, but it has that emotional impact where you're just kind of like you feel for the monster, you know? Um, so it is wonderful way to be able to kind of see how these stories can kind of interact with each other. All right, and alluding to something I said early on, here there be dragons. Dragons are like the bomb. Um, they have really started, I would say about since 2022, we started seeing a little bit, but last year, definitely when um, the fourth wing came out with Rebecca Yaros, Iron Flame is the second book that is out of that series, and people have been eating it up like crazy. They love 
that story. Um, Dragons of Deepwood Fen is um, an epic fantasy about a captive prince and a handmaid who are on the run because a baby dragon that was a gift to the royalty imprinted on the captive and now they have to get away or else be killed. Um, if you like or if you have patrons who like things a bit more spicy, you may have heard about Kit Rosha. Um, Consort of Fire is the first of a duology, which is based on a dragon god who is um, protecting the land, this land from on the borders of it from the other land next to it because otherwise they would really be kind of taken over by war. But part of that means that every hundred years the ruling family has to give the dragon god a consort. Well, the newest consort has been pr presented to the dragon god except she's got a secret. She's actually there to kill him. And her handmaiden is there with her own secrets. And there's lots of secrets. There's a lot of sex. So definitely if you have those readers who really kind of love the spiciness, this would be one that they would probably enjoy. And then Emberclaw um, is book two of... L.R. Lamb, who is Laura Lamb, who I mentioned before, and this is her um, second book of this series about dragons who were forced out of their world by the humans who live there. And then so many generations have gone by that now these dragons have been forgotten, but they're worshipped as gods. And then one day, a dragon is able to break through the barrier and now the dragons have found a way to come back and they're not happy. So we're going to see what happens next with that. So sometimes it is actually the creature or the vampire or a shifter. Sometimes people will identify that as a way to kind of look into things too. So let's pop into some reader's advisory. We've been kind of talking about it throughout while we've been talking about particular books, but obviously we kind of want to look at some of the appeal and the appeal factors, which most of you will have heard. I usually like to mix up, you know, we have our Joyce Serex, we have, um, we have our Nancy Pearl, we have novelists, they all use appeal factors, doorways, whatever. So I like to mix it up. They're all kind of the same in different ways. But really the basics come down to kind of the story or the plot and knowing if someone wants something that is very fast paced, um, if they want lots of action, there's definitely fantasy that fits that. Or do they want lots of details? Sometimes that goes into the setting, into the world building. There are definitely writers who really spend a lot of time on the world and how it works. Or you have people who really are looking at the characters. Do they want a hero story? Do they want that hero or heroine's journey that they're going on? Do they want a character that they're not quite sure if they're going to like or not, you know, who are kind of making those morally gray decisions or, you know, or are they worried about some characters who are going to die in the book? Because sometimes that can be an issue. Um, so the setting, you know, sometimes with fantasy, we are seeing those secondary worlds or secondary lands, but we're seeing a lot more, especially contemporary fantasy that is being set on earth and being set on basically an earth that we actually know and operate in. They just kind of have that side shuffle into fantasy, whether it's witches or shapeshifters or other supernatural beings or supernatural happenings or there's a god in our midst all of those if they want it really kind of more reality based that's going to be in a different direction than someone who really wants that fantasy land or a portal into a different world and then the tone, obviously you can have stuff that goes from the cozy fantasy that really kind of makes you feel 
good in the story. The people are making good decisions, happy things are happening, or you know it's going to have a happy ending. Maybe not a romance, but just that the people are coming together and they're getting what they need. Or are you looking for that grim dark? Are you looking for kind of some of that thing that puts you a little more on the edge of your seat and looking at some of those dark fantasy, you know, where you're not sure where all of the trouble is coming from? Other things that you can check into with it is obviously, you know, what are things that are turn ons or turn offs for people and turn offs are usually easier to articulate. Some people do not like blood, do not like gore. So um, there are definitely going to be books you want to keep them away from in fantasy for that. Um, they don't want people to die all the time. They don't want the dog to die. Um, there is a website for that. Did the dog die? So you want to make sure that, you know, that is something that can be a trigger for them. And we are seeing a lot more um, fantasy books, especially ones that I've been reading, where they are actually listing trigger warnings um, at the front. So sometimes that is easy to find because the author is doing that due diligence themselves. And that is actually really great because that helps a lot when you know that it's kind of laid out literally in black and white for you on what could be some of the um, sensitive issues that your readers may have. Um, if they like another genre, you know, those genre blends, fantasy is really creeping into everything. Um, I don't know which one is the peanut butter and which one is the chocolate, but they are definitely getting into each other. And you can definitely find a book that gives you the steps to get to something that has more fantasy in it. And you definitely never want to forget, you know, your other formats, your movies, your TV, most of us, I'd say probably all of us, our libraries still have DVDs, are still bringing in DVDs for people who can't quite get to the streaming services and stuff. So there are definitely ways for you to introduce fantasy or connect them with fantasy if they don't want to actually read a book and our audiobooks too, and graphic novels. So there are entryways in, in many different ways for them. So just a few resources that I wanna talk about quick. Um, my biggest one is the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Association. They are really kind of the go-to association. They are science fiction and fantasies ALA. Um, they are the ones who deal with awards, a lot of different awards. They deal with, you know, making sure writers are finding the connections that they need. They always publish an upcoming publishing list. You can find links to, like I said, award winners, which is another way to kind of find what some of the newest and most appreciated books can be. Social media, you know, depending on what you like to do or not do with social media, I will say that depending on where you are, you are going to find publishers, you are going to find authors, and you're going to find the readers there too. And sometimes you can find different suggestions on there. Um, blogs and websites, you know, obviously we have our sources like Novelist or Library Journal or, you know, different ones like the or Kirkus, any of those, but some kind of more um, visual to users or readers would be Tor.com. This is the Tor.com that existed before Tor.com, the publishing arm. Um, they're actually changing their name um, this year to kind of distinguish themselves from the publishing group, even though they kind of started there, but they're going to be changed to Reactor. And you should see that coming up, but they've really been focused on science fiction and fantasy, but I guess that they are expanding and they sometimes have new stories by um, new authors and also very popular authors. They do a lot of review. They, and it's not just um, new books, but classic books also. So you can find a lot of good information from them. 
Fantasy Faction and Fantasy Book Review are two blogs that you can also find current reviews. And sometimes um, they'll do series sweeps of things that have been published also. Bookstores. Even though we may not as library staff deal with bookstores a lot, it's still good to know where people will go sometimes or where the authors will go to kind of really focus on science fiction and fantasy. And these are some of the biggest um, fantasy bookstores that exist right now. Um, Borderland Books um, is in San Francisco. Mysterious Galaxy is in San Diego. They both really focus on um, science fiction and fantasy. So you can find a lot of information from them. And Uncle Hugo's um, Science Fiction Bookstore, which actually um, had unfortunately burned down, a, you know, a couple years ago, they had a fire which got them and also um, their brother store the brother store with them which is a mystery bookstore but they have reopened in a new location and then um two rivers bookstore in memphis tennessee so if you happen to go out traveling yourself to any of these places they'd be a good place to look at or maybe you have people who have been around there but also just it's great taking a look at their websites to see if they um have information that you may want to find. Do any of these outlets have podcasts? That's a good question. And I know that there are podcasts and I should have put them on my slide. Now I'm going to have to add a slide before I give it to Stephanie about podcasts, about fantasy. Most of the podcasts tend to be a mix of science fiction and fantasy. And I kind of wanted to lean more towards the fantasy side. I'm not sure about the outlets themselves, if they have it, but there are definitely podcasts that focus on um, speculative fiction, especially fantasy and science fiction. And we can add that information in here too. So book podcast, great, Aubrey, um, great suggestion. And I will actually add that in as a separate slide before I give it to Stephanie so that you guys have that. So just kind of to conclude out here, um, fantasy is timeless. You know, it is one of those things that you feel is kind of a constrained genre, but really in a way it's everywhere because if we think about the stories that we have heard through our own years, through things that we've been exposed to or consumed through media um, at different ages, we have gotten it there. And it's for all audiences and we know the draws, we know the authors a lot of times, depending on whether we're working adult services or we're a young adult librarian or a children's librarian, we may know those particular ones, but it's fun to see where crossovers are. And it's great to kind of introduce sometimes different audiences as crossover readers. And all of us, honestly, in one way or another, have been exposed to fantasy through media trends, you know, whether it has been TV or movies, um, whether we've read other books, maybe we liked reading about Greek mythology when we were in fifth grade. I was reading about Elizabeth the first, but I also like Greek mythology too. But so, you know, those kind of things, especially when you find students do talk about mythology through social studies classes, sometimes you will hear about them, you know, kind of be, being exposed that way. And sometimes you can grow them through that. Um, it really is a connecting genre. It has, you know, it has its hand in many different genre pies. And I don't think that there is any genre that exists that does not mix with another one. Um, I haven't really come across one yet um, in my years as a librarian, as much as we want to say, you know, oh, this is, you know, a uh, feat unto itself, you know, we can talk about literary fiction, but I know I have some fantasy books I could give you for literary fiction. Um, even that too, I would say Cadwell Turnbull with his No Gods, No Monsters. I would also say um, Alex um, Harrow with like um, 
her recent book, Starling House, those I would consider almost literary fiction. And you would just, those, you could have your readers who are like, oh, I read literary fiction, or I read, you know, that kind of strong arc and give them that because it just is enough for them to go, oh, okay. So at this point, I want to say thank you to everyone listening to me for this last hour and 20 minutes. And I know that we at this point still have time if you have any other questions for me um, for this. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Christy. This was so informative and wonderful. I loved your overview of all of the trends and genres. I think thank I just you. had a quick question because I love fantasy yeah. too. And are you seeing more trilogies lately or duologies or still a combination of the two? Because I don't I always want to read a trilogy, to be honest. <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, is there like a break in that trend? I wouldn't say there's a total break in the trend. I think that trilogies are still kind of, you know, the bulk of what we see in a lot of, um, in, in a lot of speculative fiction, um, really science fiction and fantasy. You don't really see them so much in romance or in mystery, maybe, but mystery tends to go actually longer or standalone. So trilogies really are the biggest, I think, in science fiction and fantasy. But as I said, you know, over the last couple of years is really when I've seen the duologies really start to crop up a lot more, which has been really good. Some trilogies have been novellas also. So like when it comes to time, spending time with a book or with, you know, kind of having to read through, you know, multiple books, at least with a novella, you're only talking like half a book um, for each of them. So it, it's a shorter read and usually it is crisp enough that going through three books is not as bad as when they are the larger full novels that you see where they're 300 or 500 pages as we are definitely seeing longer books with um, fantasy and where we're seeing, you know, instead of the average 350 pages, we're seeing 450 to 500 pages. And I know that we've seen even longer and they'll be serial too. So you're seeing all of those books that long. So sometimes it does take an investment to be able to read fantasy because you want to be able to, you know, kind of read these long stories. But if you like to be immersed in a book, then fantasy is definitely one genre that you can do that with. And yes, Jordan, yes, Brandon Sanderson has been known for his thousand plus page books. So yeah, yeah, they're long. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Christy. Yeah, I appreciate the novella um, aspect. I need to look into those and duology is more too. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, um, I didn't talk about it either, but short story collections, even those always come out usually um, December, November, December for a previous year where um, different editors have like gone and looked through all of these digital magazines that we talked about before, and they have found the best stories, or they've solicited some from a couple of key authors, and they'll put them together in this anthology, which sometimes is also another good way to introduce people to new authors and new genres is being able to, because they only have to commit to a story, to a short story. And they don't have to read all of the short stories if they start into one and they say, oh, that doesn't appeal to me. And then they flip to the next one. So they have an assortment to be able to check out. And then if they find an author who has published books from there, then they have a different direction to go. Awesome. Thank you. That was so helpful. And if anyone else has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or put any questions in the chat. Um, Christy is happy to answer any questions you may have. And Yes, I love it when people ask questions and make comments throughout because it's always fun to just kind of hear other perspectives. So I really appreciate hearing that from all of you too. Oh, that's a great question. Ooh. Genre of TJ. That's tough. So I feel like that could span fantasy or horror really. Yeah, I think it depends on the books we're talking about. You know, obviously, um, you know, the house 
the house next to the Cerulean Sea, especially with the new sequel coming out. That one I'm really excited. That one I would definitely put into fantasy. But he has previous books that are talking about shifters, but they are a little hard harder so whether they would be considered maybe some dark fantasy or maybe a little bit closer to horror I think it really depends but I would still put him almost solidly at least under the big umbrella of fantasy um, and TJ's great I've been able to talk with him a couple of different times on panels and he's an amazing writer and I've been excited to listen to him just talk his own stories for sure. Intriguing historical fantasy stories. Ooh, historical fantasy is one of those ones where you kind of want to know, do you want it straight history or are you looking for kind of a little romance or not so romantic? Because that'll be kind of the um, difference between, yeah, so straight history. I think you really are going to be looking at, I would start with some of the fairy tale retellings um, there have been some good ones that have come out recently in the last couple of years. I'm trying to think. There was one for um, that was a retelling of Rapunzel, but it was from um, the witch's point of view and her story, how that came up. Um, that was a really neat historical components. And... Genevieve Gornichak, who we had in here for The Witch's Heart, her next book is coming out, and that one is a Norse um, retelling of, I want to remember, see, this is this thing that happens to all of us where, like, we can describe something. I'm going to talk about all the books with the blue covers, but I can't tell you the name. <laughs> I can't tell you the author, but I will also record this when I send the stuff to Stephanie and I will send you a list. <laughs> Jennifer, so thank you. Awesome. Thank you. I can't Tracy. be the only one who has that problem. It's like, tell me what you've read that you've liked lately. Um, everything like, is gone. I haven't yeah, read everything's a book. Out of what my is head. a book? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. So Jennifer, we will send some recommendations. So thank you, you for that got question. It. Yes. Good question. Oh, Jezebel and Lilith. They would kind of fall. I mean, you know, there's this whole, it's like, it's fantasy folklore and God tales is kind of what the subgenre. I'm not exactly sure how the bisac lists it, but I see it all the time. And that would probably where those particular stories fall under because, you know, depending on your point of view of where these stories come from, um, in, you know, from historical times or from, you know, being a pantheon then you know it would still be under that particular basis of kind of I don't it's hard to say mythology when you're talking about Christianity yet at the same time it's the same description as you would for any type of pantheon whatever the religion is so yeah that's exactly the hard part it's like how do you say that it's a fiction book without saying it's a fiction book so <laughs> um, you know, and, and that's just really kind of one of those things where you're going to describe it as, you know, the person who wrote it was not there and they were not that person. So it's not nonfiction. Um, they're taking components of this historical concept. So that's what makes it historical fiction and fantasy because there are things that are not happening in the quote unquote real world um, that would be considered magical or magical elements um, with any type of, um, you know, viewing of gods or other beings that have powers beyond humanity. So there's always a way to explain it. <laughs> but yeah, it would kind of fall under that particular subgenre. So it would kind of technically it's like folktale and um, pantheon retellings, but you would want to probably phrase it a little differently, <laughs> depending on who you're talking to. And yeah, thanks, Christy. That was a great answer, too. So 
Yeah, so Christy, I hope that helped. Well, Christy in the chat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're also welcome. I'm going to send Christy's email to everyone afterwards. So you're yes. welcome to reach out at any time if you have any questions later. Do you reach out to me. My email's there. Um, when I am on social media, basically on any social media, that is the handle you can find me under. So you can find me that way too. And I'm happy to talk fantasy and science yeah. fiction too. But for here, I'll definitely talk fantasy. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Christy. Again, this was amazing. Thank, thank you again you for so being much. here. It was such a great presentation. Yeah, I always love coming to talk to the New Jersey librarians. So thank you so much for inviting me back.